Welcome everyone to How Nonprofit Staff Can Get Student Debt Forgiven. I'm Christina Dragonetti. I'm the Nonprofit Student Debt Project Manager for the California Association of Nonprofits, which is sort of a counterpart to the Nonprofit Association of the Midlands. I would like to thank uh, you guys over there at the Midlands for inviting me to provide this webinar to all of your folks today. Um, it's important information and uh, we found that it's uh, information about the Public Service Loan Forgiveness Program is really scarce out there. A lot of people don't know about this program or they think it's a scam, um, which is unfortunate. So we will be getting started. Just a housekeeping thing here. Um, we're not using that raise your hand feature. Um, for those of you who are uh, at your computers, um, you are not able to talk. <laughs> so please put any questions that you have in that Q&A box and uh, I'll be able to answer those potentially as we go along, depending on uh, if you need clarification on something that I'm talking about at the moment, um, but I will be collecting questions and answering them at the end. If there's a question that you know you have right now that you want to get into that Q&A box, um, and then I can answer it either as we're going along or, uh, or at the end, and I did save some time at the end um, for questions. So, um, I know that, you know, when this, this, I, I'm a cat person, so uh, when I found this picture of these cats and uh, one being the student loan and the other one being me, I thought, wow, that's really perfect. <laughs> um, definitely describes how I feel sometimes about my student loans. So just a few fun facts about student loans in case you thought you were alone. Um, nationwide, there are 45 million borrowers who owe 1.5 trillion with a T in debt, uh, just on their student loans. Um, the next most debt owed by Americans is on their houses. So uh, this, is, this is significant. Um, it's, it's a lot of money and it's a lot of debt and it's unprecedented in our country. Um, bankruptcy does not eliminate, eliminate your student debt. Um, unfortunately, if you declare bankruptcy, you can get pretty much anything wiped out, but not your student debt. Um, so that's one of the things that we are working on trying to get uh, into some laws in the future, but uh, so far right now, that uh, bankruptcy doesn't help out. Since 1999, student debt has increased by 500%. Um, this is a really huge problem. This is uh, not just, you know, hey, I owe a few thousand dollars or I'm struggling to pay my student loans. This is a, a national issue. Um, and 7 million people defaulted on their, are defaulted on their student loans right now. Um, so if you've defaulted on your loans, you're not alone. Um, and there are ways to come back from that and you wanna make sure that you, um, get out of the default status as soon as you can. Uh, there's lots of different options available. Um, I'm not gonna go through all of those today, but just so you know that if you're one of those 7 million, um, there are options for you. Um, so, um, I don't see any questions in the chat box yet, but I just wanted to let those of you who have just joined us know that if you have questions, go ahead and put them in that Q&A box. Um, so why did Cal Nonprofits start the Nonprofit Student Debt Project? Well, we did a survey in 2016. We found uh, a thousand people responded, which was significant. Um, people are concerned and really interested in talking about this. And that survey really informed how we put together this project. And so it's two prongs. Um, there's education, which is things like this webinar. Um, we have a public service loan forgiveness toolkit on our website. Site, and you can see at the bottom there, that's our website for the Nonprofit Student Debt Project. You can find out more about the FAQs and resources that we have available. And then the other side of what we're doing is advocacy. Um, we have a Nonprofit Student Debt Task Force who helps inform our advocacy work. There is a National Public Service Loan Forgiveness Coalition, and I'll give you some information about that if you want to get involved with that. Um, and those are folks working in Washington, D.C. on the Public Service Loan Forgiveness um, legislation and attempts to get rid of it, unfortunately. Um, so I'll give you some more information about that towards the end of the webinar. What we really need for our advocacy work is stories from nonprofit staff. So if you are interested in talking to the media or if you have a story that you wanna share about your debt and about your experience with trying to get your debt paid or the Public Service Loan Forgiveness Program in particular, let me know. 
um, and I will give you my contact information at the end of the webinar. And then we're also focused on supporting student debt relief legislation, um, specifically in California, but also uh, in uh, Washington, DC. So that's a little bit about Cal nonprofits and what we do. Um, so on today's agenda, we're going to talk about public service loan forgiveness, how it works, what it is, scams and getting help. Uh, unfortunately, there are a lot of scams out there. I'm going to provide you some resources for getting help. I also want to talk about how managers, so nonprofits as employers, can support their staff with student debt. Um, sometimes you have the student debt and you're a manager of people who have student debt, so uh, it's a little bit different position to be in, so we're going to talk about that. And also what you can do right this minute to support yourself and your colleagues in uh, their student jet debt journey. Um, so let's see. Oh, I just want to make sure that I put this out there. Um, I'm not a lawyer. I'm not a financial accountant. I'm not a consultant. Um, this is information that I'm providing for uh, educational purposes. And uh, you're welcome to ask me questions. If I don't know the answer, I will pass you on to uh, other resources. Um, so public service loan forgiveness, uh, like I said, some people think that it's a scam because it's too good to be true. Um, actually, it's not a scam and uh, it's almost too good to be true. There's a lot of hoops to jump through, but uh, the reason that I personally am in love with public service loan forgiveness uh, is because it's going to help me. Um, I have debt and I want to get out of debt uh, so uh, and I want to stay in the nonprofit sector so um, just a little bit of background um, this was a federal program it was started in 2007 it was actually bipartisan legislation under George W Bush um, if you can believe it um, President Obama expanded some of the options when it came to the public service loan forgiveness and particularly the repayment plans um, but the core of the program and the essential qualification uh, all stayed the same um, when you have a lot of student debt, or even when you have a little bit of student debt, uh, it can really impact your decisions about buying property, about having children, about getting married. Um, all of those things are impacted by the amount of disposable income that you have. And there are studies that show that the amount of student debt uh, that we have uh, kind of as, you know, working people in uh, the workforce and, and the impact that it has on our economy, it is pretty significant. Um, we're not buying cars, we're not buying houses, we're not contributing to the economy in ways that we otherwise would. So it is a significant problem. Um, when we're looking at retirement, when we're looking at minimal savings, um, trying to stay in the nonprofit sector can be a tough decision for folks. Um, and we need your talent, we need your skills, particularly people who've been in the sector for five, eight, 10, 20 years, um, and then they leave because they realize they can't, you know, pursue other goals and, and their dreams with a nonprofit salary and the uh, student debt that they're saddled with. Um, so this is a, a definitely a problem. It also impacts diversity in the sector. Um, folks who are people of color tend to graduate with more student debt, and that obviously impacts the jobs that they can take or that they're looking for. So even if they want to go into the nonprofit sector, they feel like, hmm, that's not really going to work out for them. So public service loan forgiveness is one tool that we have to recruit lots of different kinds of people into the nonprofit sector, and just as importantly, keep them. Um, we want folks to stay in the nonprofit sector and use all their skills and passion um, for our communities. So let's get into the nitty gritty details of public service loan forgiveness and how you qualify. Um, there's, I've, I've structured this so that there's five steps, so there's five different um, pieces of qualification that you need to meet before you can get the, the loan forgiveness. So. Um, first, you have to have the right loan type, and I'll go into those. Then you have to be on a qualified repayment plan. There are five of those. Uh, we'll go through those. You have to be employed full-time, uh, and that is full-time for one job or full-time when you add up multiple part-time jobs. So either way, um, uh, but you have to be employed full-time. You have to be employed full-time by qualified employers. Uh, so we'll go into that. And you have to make 120 monthly payments. And these are qualifying monthly payments. So uh, as you can see, there's a lot of the word qualified and there's a lot of um, different nuances and uh, different things that we're gonna go through. It can be quite complicated. So as I said before, for those of you who just joined us, I will be sending the recording of this presentation and also my slides to everybody uh, tomorrow or the next day so that you don't have to take frantic notes. Uh, you will have all this information. But once you have, 
met all of these different steps, the remaining balance of your loans are forgiven. So you will have paid on your loans for at least 10 years. So you will have brought down the principal hopefully by some, um, but sometimes folks are paying interest only or even less than interest, which is this case with one of my loans. Uh, and so at the end of the 10 years, you may actually owe more than you borrowed. Um, whatever that balance is will be forgiven when you apply for forgiveness and you prove that you meet all, all of these qualifications. So whatever that remaining balance is, it is forgiven. And one of the absolute jewels of the public service loan forgiveness program is that you will not have to pay income tax on the amount that is forgiven. Other forgiveness programs do require you to pay income tax on the amount that is forgiven. So for example, if you get to the end of your 10 years and $10,000 is forgiven under one of the other uh, repayment, uh, I'm sorry, one of the other forgiveness programs, that $10,000 counts as income for you for that, for that year and you have to pay income tax on it. So that can bump you up to the next income bracket. Uh, so anyway, it can really play havoc with people's um, finances, but with public service loan forgiveness, that is not an issue. So another reason why I absolutely adore this program. So I'm not seeing any questions, so I'm going to keep going. I'm sure as we get into the nitty-gritty, you guys will have more questions. So let's start out with loan types. Um, the loan type that you have, you have to have a federal direct loan. Um, these are, they used to be called subsidized Stafford loans or direct subsidized loans, unsubsidized Stafford loans or direct unsubsidized loans, um, grad plus loans, parent plus loans. Parent plus loans did not used to be included in the program and now they are. So fantastic for those of you who uh, helped your kids go through college, um, your parent plus loans, as long as they are federal direct loans, uh, also qualify now. And then if you have a consolidation loan, so if you have a couple of different kinds of loans and you consolidate into a loan, as long as it is a federal direct loan, then it will be included um, and it does qualify. Loans that do not qualify, any private loans, so loans with a bank, unfortunately. Um, the federal family education loans, uh, they don't offer those anymore, but for a long time they were, and unfortunately they are not included in the program. Um, that's just one of the really unfortunate battles that, uh, that we did not win um, when this program was implemented. And then loans from family or friends. <clears throat> Unfortunately, those are not, uh, not eligible. Um, if you don't know what kind of loans that you have, um, you can look in the National Student Loan Data System and the uh, URL is there. Um, and you can put in your information there and it'll tell you exactly what kinds of loans you have. And you'll be able to say, oh, okay, great. These qualify, these don't. Um, we can put them together on a consolidation loan. You can make decisions. So you'll have the information about your specific loans um, from the National Student Loan Data System. That has everything in it. So let's talk about qualified repayment plans. So these are uh, what determine your monthly payments. And for some people, uh, if they're on an income-based repayment plan and all of these, uh, except for the last one, the standard plan, these are all what we call income-based or income-contingent repayment plans. So the amount that you pay per month is tied to your um, salary. And uh, some people, if you make a minimal amount, um, then your loan payment would be zero. So if you are in that situation where your payment is zero, even though you're not actually paying any money per month, it still counts as a qualified repayment plan. It still counts as a qualified payment, even though you're not actually giving anybody any money every month. So um, that's really great. So any of these plans, um, income-based repayment plans, so if your loans were before July 1st of 2014, if that's when they originated, so in other words, if that's when you took out the loan, then you qualify for income-based repayment plan. All of these repayment plans have a built-in discharge. So if you've paid on them for, for example, income-based repayment plan, you pay on it for 25 years, the rest of your balances uh, are forgiven. However, you do pay income tax on whatever that amount that is forgiven. Also, 25 years, ooh, if that's the situation that you're in, unfortunately, but at least it will go away after 25 years. Um, Income-based repayment plan two, um, which is the one they came up with. It has a little bit better repayment terms. Um, your monthly payment will be a little bit lower if you qualify for that. And that's only for loans that originated after July 1st of 2014. 
And then uh, the Obama administration came up with a few others, um, pay as you earn and revised pay as you earn. So you can switch between these different uh, loan repayment plans uh, as you're going through your trying to qualify for a public service loan forgiveness. Um, as long as you are on one of these plans um, as you're going through, then you're fine. You can, I've switched between a couple of them over the years and that's fine. And then the last one I just want to talk about briefly, the standard repayment plan. If you've been making the standard, uh, if you're on the standard repayment plan, that has you set to um, pay off your loans entirely in 10 years. So oftentimes, particularly for those of us who are in the nonprofit sector, that standard 10-year plan monthly payment is just crazy. Um, so all of these other income contingent plans are eligible. Um, but if you've been paying on that standard repayment plan, uh, those payments will qualify, um, but I suggest uh, looking into getting onto one of the other payment plans uh, if that's gonna work for your situation. Again, I am not a finance person, so you wanna make sure that you look at your entire financial picture to see if that will work. Um, that URL at the bottom, student loan Uh, will give you a payment estimator. It'll tell you exactly what your monthly payment would be under these different plans. So you can go in there and plug in, in your information and it'll tell you exactly what your monthly payment would be. Uh, and you can pick the plan that makes the most sense for you. So still not seeing any questions, so I'm going to keep going. So what does full time mean? Full-time means that you're a W-2 employee, that you have uh, wages from your employer. <clears throat> you have to work 30 or more hours per week for one or multiple employers. Uh, 30 hours per week is considered full-time, so I know a lot of people think 40 hours is full-time. For the purposes of the Public Service Loan Forgiveness Program, 30 hours is considered full-time. You can be in any position, any job duties, any salary. You can be the executive director, you can be the janitor, you can be the receptionist, you can be the program staff. Um, anybody who is uh, working for the nonprofit uh, is eligible for the public service loan forgiveness. You have to work for a qualified employer, and I'm going to go into that in a minute, and you can be a temporary or a permanent employee. Um, there is some confusion over uh, contractors. So if you're a contractor and you work for a nonprofit organization, um, so not a W-2 employee, um, I would recommend trying to qualify for the program, submitting your employment certification form. I'm going to go into that in a minute. Um, but I, right now there's some confusion about that and there's some people that saying, yes, you qualify. Other people are saying, no, you don't. So um, just keep that in mind. If you're a contractor, maybe, maybe not. Um, you have to just give it a try. You definitely do not qualify if you're a volunteer, if you work less than 30 hours per week on average. So if you have you know, jobs that are seasonal, things like that, it's an average over the year. If you have a private sector employee, so if you're working for a, a company that's a private sector employer, that doesn't count. And also it doesn't count if your loans are not in your name. So if you as a parent or a spouse work for a nonprofit organization, but the loans are actually in your child or your spouse's uh, name, you have to be the one who's working in the nonprofit and the loan has to be in your name in order for the public service loan forgiveness to work. Um, and let's see, I did get a question. Um, so this is about, I had a direct loan, was told I had to reconsolidate. Now I'm being told that five years of payments you had won't qualify. The clock starts over with a new loan with the Department of Education. It depends on the loan that you had before. Um, that can be the case, uh, but also it may not be the case. Um, so uh, after this presentation, if you still have some questions, um, I'm gonna give you some resources for folks that can help you figure that out um, a little bit more. Um, uh, a little bit more clearly. Um, and there's also a fix to the program that's, uh, that's about, you know, being on the wrong repayment plan and, and that kind of thing. Um, but that's specific to repayment plans, not to the loan types. So uh, you're going to need to do a little bit more research about that. Qualified employers. This is a little bit of a murky land, but there are some points of clarity. If you work for a 501c3 nonprofit, they are all eligible. Any 501c3 nonprofit organization is eligible for a public service loan forgiveness program. Also, if you work for the government, any government job, um, as long as you are not working on a campaign for uh, a candidate for office, um, if you work for the state, if you work for the city, if you work for the federal government, any government job qualifies. 
if you're in the Peace Corps, the time that you're in the Peace Corps, that also qualifies as long as you are making payments on a qualified repayment plan while you're in the Peace Corps. And I know most people who go into the Peace Corps, they put their student loans on deferment um, or forbearance. And uh, unfortunately, if you're in those statuses, it doesn't count. Um, so if you're in the Peace Corps and you're making payments, particularly if your payments are zero, um, then that time that you're in there counts. Um, also, AmeriCorps. Same thing, um, if you're in AmeriCorps, you have the option to put your loans in deferment or forbearance. Um, if you choose not to do that and continue to make um, payments, then that time will count. Where we go from here is the qualifying payments. So what counts as a qualifying payment? Of course, there are some hoops to jump through here. So one full on-time payment per month, every month for 10 years, while employed full-time, for a qualified employer is your 120 qualifying payments. You need to have 120 qualifying payments in order to qualify for public service loan forgiveness. So the actual forgiveness comes after you've made your 120 qualifying payments. So let's look at a couple of scenarios where your payment may not qualify. If you make two payments in one month, that is not a, a qualify, that's one qualifying payment. You don't get credit for both. So if you accidentally make two payments in a month or you're trying to speed up the process, that doesn't work. Any late payments, uh, and that's uh, any payment made 10 days after or more after your um, payment due date, those don't count. Any payments that you do make while your loans are in the grace period in forbearance or deferment, um, they have to be active loans in repayment uh, in order for the uh, payments to count. If you're unemployed or if you're less than 30 hours and you're making payments, those don't count. And payments while you're on a non-qualified repayment plan, unfortunately, those don't count either. There is a quick fix, uh, a temporary um, reprieve for people who fit all the other qualifications but are not on a qualified repayment plan, and I'll go over the details of that in a minute. It is brand new. And so, for example, <clears throat> if you work for two years at a 501c3 nonprofit, so that's 24 one payment per month, and then you go to a private company for two years and you continue to make your payments, and then you come back to nonprofits for another year, another 12 payments, you'll have 36 qualifying payments, even though there will be 24 payments that you've made, you made those while you were at the private company, those don't count. Um, so I see we do have some questions that have come in. So, um, do schools count? Um, yes, schools do count for the public service loan forgiveness. Um, so if you're a teacher, um, public service loan forgiveness does extend to you. There are also other teacher forgiveness plans um, out there. Um, mostly they're state by state, so you want to look into that um, in your state. Um, and, uh, and, and there's one or two federal programs, um, not my area of expertise, but definitely um, something to look into. It might be uh, a little bit faster, a little bit easier for you to qualify for those. Um, so definitely look into those options. Okay, um, looks like um, Perkins loans. Are Perkins loans a qualified loan type? I'm not 100% sure about Perkins loans. Um, I don't think so because I don't think they, qua they qualify as um, federal direct loans, but, um, but you should uh, look into that. Um, there's more details on the uh, website. I'm going to give you the website for the Public Service Loan Forgiveness Program. Um, and I can't quite recall P Perkins loans. It has to be a federal direct loan, and I'm not sure if Perkins loans are federal direct um, or not. So sorry about that. So let's go through all of those things. I know I went, they went by pretty quickly. Um, so we're going to go look at the checklist. So first, do you have the right loan type? Are you on a qualified repayment plan? Are you employed full time? And remember, that's 30 hours per week on average for one or more employers. Is your employer qualified? Um, so you want to make sure that you're working for uh, qualified employers. And then what do you do? You submit the employment certification form every year. Every year, even though it's not required, you are only required to submit the employment certification forms after your 120 payments and you're applying for forgiveness. Don't wait. That's my number one piece of advice today. Do not wait. Uh, you want to, any, uh, 
employers that you've worked for in the past, make sure that you get them to sign the employment certification form and submit those right away. Uh, whoever you're currently working for, uh, make sure that you submit uh, an employment certification form right away for that employer as well and every year going forward. Um, if you're on an income-based repayment plan, which you should be, then uh, you have to um, re-qualify for that plan every year. So what I do um, every year it comes around, I need to submit my paperwork to stay on that repayment plan. Um, I also submit my employment certification form at the same time. Um, that way it reminds me to just keep current with everything. When you submit your employment certification forms, uh, that is how FedLoan will keep track of how many um, qualifying payments that you've made. Um, and sometimes we disagree with FedLoan, and so we wanna make sure that you get those employment certification forms in so that you can get them double-checked by FedLoan and, uh, and, and you, know, you can keep track of your payments. And also if they say, oh no, these were not, qualifying payments for some reason, you can um, figure, do some research, figure that out, and maybe argue with them. Um, lots of people have had to argue with FedLoan over the years. Uh, I'm going to talk about FedLoan in just a minute. Um, so uh, don't need to worry about figuring out who that is right now. <laughs> um, so like I said, my number one piece of advice today, submit your employment certification forms right away if you haven't done it yet and every year going forward. Um, we have a question near the end of my career may look at retirement a year and a half out am I out of luck um, well unfortunately you have to be making payments while you're employed full-time so if you're going to retire you won't be pay, uh, working full-time those payments won't count um, it's possible that you've already done your 10 years um, and you can uh, apply for forgiveness sometime between now and when you retire but unfortunately, the program was designed to keep people working for the nonprofit sector, so you do have to be working while you're making the payments. Um, so, sorry about that. Um, oh, you have done your 10 years. Great. So, you may qualify for, get for forgiveness now. Um, so, uh, go through uh, this checklist at the end of the webinar and see if you can uh, qualify and get that application submitted uh, immediately <laughs> to see if you can uh, get that forgiveness right away, which was great. Uh, Tess asks, where do you get the employment certification form? You get that from the FedLoan site, um, and I'll show you that in a minute, um, and uh, also from the Public Service Loan Forgiveness uh, studentdebt.gov, I think is what it is. Um, I'll show you those URLs um, in just a couple of minutes. I'll show you where to get that. Um, so make sure, let's see, uh, any other questions? Okay, great. So we're going to keep going. So I'm going to go through an example. I'm going to use myself as an example. I graduated in 2007 from grad school with $78,000 in debt, uh, which is a little bit daunting. I knew when I graduated, probably not going to be able to buy a house, might not be able to retire when I want to, but I have my education. I'm going to work for the nonprofit sector. It's what my heart wanted to do. So I was like, all right, suck it up. Let's go. Then the Public Service Loan Forgiveness Program came out and yay, I'm gonna be able to uh, do other things like maybe buy some property. Um, but let's go through the checklist one by one using myself as an example. So I have lo one loan that originated in 1998 for my undergrad, doesn't qualify. I had one private loan, doesn't qualify. I have to pay those off entirely on my own. No help there. Uh, I had two graduate plus loans in 2005 and one in 2006. Those didn't count. But in 2009, I consolidated those into a federal direct consolidated loan, and that counts. So 2009 is when my clock started for um, getting my forgiveness. Um, and uh, so that's the right loan type. You want to make sure you have the right loan types. Now, step two, repayment plans. Um, for the first few years after I graduated, I was on something called the graduated repayment plan or graduated extended repayment plan. Anyway, it was the lowest possible payment at that moment, and that's what I needed at the time. So all of the payments that I made while I was on that repayment plan, none of them counted. 
I switched to the income-based repayment plan in 2012, uh, which is great. And then in 2015, I switched to repay, which is one of those qualified repayment plans. Um, so my monthly payment actually went down when I switched from the income-based repayment to the repay plan. So yay for that. Um, and payments made on both of those plans count. Um, so like I said, my um, my loan type wasn't correct until 2009, so that's when my clock started, but I wasn't on the right repayment plan. So my clock started <laughs> actually in uh, 2012. Um, so that's when my, you know, first payment started to qualify, and then I count the 10 years from there. Um, full time. Luckily for me, the jobs that I've had while I've worked in the nonprofit sector, the first job that I, uh, first couple jobs I had, 37.5 hours per week qualifies over 30 hours a week. I've been working 40 hours a week after that, so those qualify. So that was easy. Qualified employers. My first employer was the Center for Volunteer and Nonprofit Leadership. They're a 501c3. They qualify. I also work for TechSoup. Um, as an aside, if you don't know about TechSoup.org and you work for a nonprofit, go there immediately after you've done all your public service loan forgiveness stuff. It's a great resource for nonprofits. It has to do with technology and getting technology donations. I work there. They were fabulous. <laughs> um, also 501c3, so they count. Uh, currently, I work for Cal Nonprofits, and they are a 501c3, so they count. So that's great. All of my employers have counted. Qualifying payments. I spent four months in deferment. I needed some time, so I spent four months in deferment. None of those months count. I missed a payment one month. Uh, I had two late payments in this time, so that's seven payments that don't qualify that I've been making even though I've been on the right, I had the right loan, I had the right repayment plan, I was working full time for qualified employers, I had a few payments that don't count. Not the end of the world. Um, it doesn't disqualify you uh, entirely for the program. It just means that those months don't count. So I have made a total of 113 payments on my loans, but only 56 of those have qualified. And so I am looking at getting my loans forgiven in April of 2022. Uh, that is a date that is circled on my whiteboard at home. Um, it's a very exciting date for me to think about. Uh, my loans will be forgiven. Um, as I said, one of my loans is, uh, currently my payment is not covering all of the interest. So by the end of my 10 years, I will owe a lot more than when I took out the loan. So I will be really happy to have that go away in April of 2022. And knowing that date helps me plan for my future, um, helps me figure out you know, if I wanna have children, if I wanna buy some property, um, maybe plan a big vacation, <laughs> so that kind of thing. So that is a really happy day. Um, and let's see, we have a question, a loan from 1998 that was consolidated that you didn't qualify for a teacher forgiveness program. I don't know anything about teacher forgiveness programs. I'm so sorry. Um, you'll need to look into the details of that with uh, whoever the, the, um, the uh, teacher forgiveness program is. Um, but that's not related to the public service loan forgiveness program. Um, and Christina asks, uh, will you be sending out the recording? Yes, I will be sending out the recording of this presentation as well as all of my slides. So you'll have all of this information. Um, and figuring out your total payments versus your qualifying payments. You don't need to know what your total payments are. I figured it out for this presentation. Um, but your qualifying payments, when you submit your employment certification forms to Fed Loan Servicing, they will calculate that and they will tell you. Um, so you want to figure out, you know, when you had the right loan type, when you're on the right repayment plan, while you were working full time for a qualified employer, and all of your qualifying payments, you know, if you were late or whatever, um, you can add all those up yourself and see if what you come up with agrees with what Fed Loan Servicing comes up with. Your total payments that you make kind of doesn't matter, only the qualifying payments matter. Um, so, and great. Um, so no more questions for now. So I'm gonna keep going. So, if you're on the wrong repayment plan, uh, this has been a huge problem because loan servicers were lying to people when they talked about public service loan forgiveness. Um, 
they say they had the wrong information. Um, sometimes I believe they were outright, outright lying to people. Um, anyway, this has been a huge problem um, throughout the life of this program. So many people are complaining about being on the wrong repayment plan because they didn't know um, or because they were lied to or scammed. Um, so uh, a recent um, law that was passed included uh, what they called a technical fix to the program. And it is relief for folks who qualify in all of the other ways, but were on the wrong repayment plan. Um, so if you had federal direct loans and they originated after 2007, which is when the program started, you've worked full time for 501c3 or other qualified employers, you've made your 120 qualifying payments, but you were on the wrong repayment plan. Oh no! There's a little bit of potential help for you. It's called the Temporary Expanded PSLF, T-E-P-S-L-F. You can tell people really like acronyms in this program. It is $350 million, uh, a chunk of money that was set aside for folks in this situation. It's not a huge amount of money, but it is a significant amount, and it is offered on a first come, first served basis. So if you think that you're in this situation, make sure that you figure it out and uh, um, get uh, a request in to be reconsidered as soon as possible. It is first come, first serve, and it is based on the amount of money that gets forgiven. So if you have a whole bunch of people with $400,000 in loans and uh, they are get into the program first, that money is going to disappear pretty fast. Uh, luckily, there are very, very, very few of those folks. So if you feel like you're in this situation, make sure that you um, submit for, uh, for getting this uh, this, this fix for the temporary expanded. Um, and you can go to studentaid.ed.gov to find out more about it. Um, you have to dig around a little bit. It's under the um, Public Service Loan Forgiveness Program, but there are details about uh, how, what, what qualifies um, for this, and then also how to, um, how to get reconsidered. Um, and right now, um, like I said, this is brand new. Uh, they just came up with it. Uh, just within the last few weeks, and they just came up with a process for getting people uh, reviewed. We don't know how well it's going to work. Their track record on these things is not great. Um, so make sure that you document every stage of what you're doing and um, any responses that you get from them. Uh, make sure that you uh, hold on to those. So loan servicers and scams. Uh, sometimes it can feel like the Wild West. Also, I just really like dragons, so I thought this was a cool picture. Um, but people are being scammed and loan servicers are giving out false information. So let me tell you a little bit about how to avoid those. Never, ever, ever, ever pay anyone to file your public service loan forgiveness forms or to qualify you for loan forgiveness. I got a call two weeks ago from somebody saying, hey, we can qualify you for this great new program. Find out if you can lower your uh, monthly payments and uh, we can file your forms for you. There's just, you know, the small fee that we're gonna charge you. And uh, so I said, no, thank you. And um, just watch out for that because there are a lot of companies out there that are saying that they can do this and they're doing exactly what I am doing for you today. You can do it for yourself. It is seems really complicated, but it's fairly straightforward when you get into the details. Um, don't ever, ever pay anyone uh, to help you out with this. Um, look for URLs ending in .gov. Um, there are some organizations out there like studentdebtcrisis.org. Um, they are also a really great trusted resource, um, but make sure that you are not uh, submitting your personal information, particularly if it's on a website that does not end in .gov research and verify even if the information that you're getting is from your loan servicer they either don't know what they're talking about they might be lying um, just make sure that whatever they tell you don't just trust it I'll make sure that you do the research and that you verify uh, that you either qualify or you don't qualify if they tell you that you're on the right loan the wrong loan make sure that you research and verify the information on your own separately. If you do run into a problem um, or if you feel like you've been lied to or misled, um, you can reach out to the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau. They do have a student loan um, kind of help area. Uh, they are in some flux right now, so I don't know how well they're uh, able to respond to complaints, um, but you can go there and file a complaint. Um, the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau has sued a couple of the loan servicers for being deliberately misleading, um, for lying to people, basically. And, uh, and so they are aware that this happens, and uh, they might be able to 
Um, in very, very rare cases, they can actually intervene for you personally, um, but more, it's more likely that they'll be able to just um, add fuel to uh, forcing loan forgiveness, I'm sorry, loan servicers to um, provide restitution, um, or at least make sure that they tell people the truth. I'm not seeing any questions, so I'm gonna keep going. So I mentioned studentaid.ed.gov. This is a trusted uh, resource. Um, so studentaid.ed.gov and also studentloans.gov. Those are two resources that you can go to get the information. Um, all the information that I've talked about today is uh, on those sites. And you can see also on there is the teacher loan forgiveness program. So uh, for those of you who are teachers, you can check that out as well. Um, it, it is in a fairly plain language format. It does walk you through. Um, and this is where you can get the um, forgiveness application and also the employment certification application. Um, so studentaid.ed.gov is your friend. Um, and now I mentioned Fed Loan Servicing. So Fed Loan is the loan servicing company, um, much like Sally Mae or Nelnet or ACS. Um, they are the one, but they are the ones that are contracted with the federal government to manage the public service loan forgiveness program. So you need to have FedLoan as your servicer. You don't need to have FedLoan as your servicer for the life of your loan. It's not a qualifying anything, um, but you do have to have FedLoan as your servicer when you apply for forgiveness. Um, so when you submit your employment certification form, if FedLoan is not your loan servicer, they will automatically switch you so that they can start tracking your um, progress towards public service loan forgiveness. Um, FedLoan themselves, even though they are the ones who manage the program, have been giving out false information to people. There's been a lot of confusion. Um, so even if your loan servicer is FedLoan, again, verify the information that they're giving you um, and make sure that when you have an account with them, as they go through and process your employment certification forms, they're going to tell you um, exactly how many qualifying payments that you've made and when your forgiveness date is. If you feel like they are wrong, then make sure that you go through and find all the paperwork and resubmit it to them. Um, in the eight years that I've been working with them, they've lost my uh, paperwork twice, three times actually, I think, um, even though you're uploading it to their site directly, somehow it just magically disappears. Um, so just make sure that you keep copies of everything and that you log into your account periodically to make sure that um, everything is still on track and that your information agrees with their information. Um, otherwise, you can contact them and they will uh, get it straightened out, but you have to have copies of everything. Um, so. Let's see, Marie says, so once the paperwork is filed, they will change you from Nelnet to FedLoan. Yes, um, when you file your first employment certification form, you will automatically be switched over. Um, one of the things that they do is they will also often put your loans in forbearance or deferment for the month or so that you're changing over. Um, I believe you have to opt in or opt out of that. So just pay attention um, because you may end up making a payment that is not a qualifying payment um, because your loans have been put into forbearance for that month while they're doing the switchover. Um, my experience has been that the switchovers are pretty quick, pretty painless, um, but again, sometimes things happen and you just want to stay on top of it and make sure that you're paying attention. Um, great. So no other questions, so I'm going to keep going. So now I'm going to switch to talking about you as a manager or as the employer, um, and then I'll uh, talk a little bit more at the end about some other things. But just uh, quickly for now, one of the things that we found in our survey was that um, managers really want to help out staff. Um, and, and this is a quote from somebody who I, I really felt like kind of captured um, the whole essence of it, the nonprofit world absolutely cannot and should not rely on employees who have economic security thanks to their families. This is an institutional bias that reduces diversity and privileges those who already have privilege. Keep that in mind. and tell everyone you know about this program. So, um, so one of the things we came up with was the toolkit for nonprofit managers. You can find it on our website. Uh, it's free and it talks about free and low cost ways to support your staff. It also includes a sample email to current staff about the public service loan forgiveness, a new hire letter, um, a handout for staff with all the eligibility requirements. Uh, there is a link to the employment certification form. This is the one that needs to be signed by the employer, but submitted by the employee. 
um, a link to the online FAQs and also a list of resources. So you can go to our website, download that for free, and, uh, and you'll have all of that information. Um, and hopefully it will answer all of your questions if you're a manager or an HR person, um, or you can share this with your manager or executive director or HR person and uh, let them know that this is something that they can do that's free. Um, it costs a little bit of time and that's all, and uh, it can be a huge, huge help to uh, nonprofit staff. The employment certification form. Um, I'm going to go through, it's not super complicated, it's only two pages, um, but sometimes people get a little bit stuck, so I'm just going to go through it briefly. The first page um, is just the information about you as the borrower um, or the nonprofit employee. Uh, it has uh, questions like your name and your address and your social security number, um, and that's pretty much it. Make sure you sign that first page. Um, it has to have your signature, your employer, so your HR manager, your executive director, whoever it is, needs to sign the second page, but you need to sign the first page. I submitted one once that did not have a signature. It ended up being a mess. Don't, just make sure you have it. Um, then on the second page, this is the page that your HR manager, executive director, that the um, nonprofit fills out. Um, and it has, you know, name, employer identification, address, website, um, employment begin date, so whatever your start date was, and then your end date. Um, so if you have previous employers that you worked for while you were qualifying for the program, you can go back and get them to sign this. They put in your end date. Um, or if you're still employed by them, then you just mark the still, still employed. Um, they have to say whether you are full-time or part-time, and then average hours per week. So even if they mark full-time, they still need to put in your average hours per week. It includes vacation, leave time, leave taken under FMLA, all of that kind of thing. So um, there's a little bit of instructions there. Um, like I said, the form itself is two pages, but it comes with an additional four pages of instructions. So if you get lost or confused, you can um, check those areas as well. Um, so that's the first eight questions. Then nine through 13 walks you through what kind, are you a qualified employer? Um, so Qualified employers are 501c3 organizations, public universities, private nonprofit schools, public schools. So the way the questions are structured, you know, question number nine is, are you a government agency? If you check no, then you go to question 10 and it says, are you a 501c3 organization? And you click yes, and then skip to the end, sign it, you're done. If it's a no, then you go on to the next questions and it walks you through, well, are you this? Well, are you that? Well, are you this? Well, are you that? Um, and then it'll tell you, you know, if you, if you, had to click check no on all of these questions, then it's not a qualified employer. Um, like I said, it's uh, government, Peace Corps, AmeriCorps, and then there's 501c3, maybe, you know, a 501c6, um, 501c8, um, those as long as they provide specific services. So I'm going to go into that in a minute, but we know for a fact that anybody who works for a 501c4 organization does not qualify if you're working on a political campaign or if you work for a labor union. Um, not if you're in a labor union, but if you work for a labor union, unfortunately, none of those are qualified employers categorically. Um, so that 501c something else uh, that provides specific services. So what are those services? And this is question 13. If you provide emergency management, uh, if it's military service, public safety, law enforcement, public interest, uh, legal services, and it says C section six, um, those are referring to the instructions on the next few pages. Um, so you have to, if you're a 501c something else and you provide one or more of these services, then it's likely that your employer will qualify. Some of this is up in the air. Um, Folks who uh, are public interest lawyers uh, who worked for 501c, I believe they were sixes, and they um, were working in organizations that provide services to veterans. Um, the uh, Fed law, the Department of Education said, oh no, no, that doesn't count. Um, so the American Bar Association is suing the Department of Education. That has not been resolved yet. Um, so if you're in one of these um, categories where you're a 501c something else and you do provide these services, just know that it's a little bit murky right now, um, but you should definitely still fill it out, sign it, submit it. Um, you want to get your information on the record so that when a decision comes out about those things, you know where you stand. Um, so it looks like we have a couple 
of questions here. Do you fill out one form for multiple employment? No, it's one form per employer. So um, you should submit it every year going forward. But if you worked for an organization for five years, you fill out one form. You know, you started in 2010, you finished in 2015, and you submit one form for that employer. If you're currently employed, then you just say, you know, I started in um, 2015, I'm currently employed, submit that. Again, next year, I started in 2015, I'm still employed, submit that again. Um, so you wanna do it every year going forward. It's not, as I said, it's not required, but highly, highly, highly recommended. Um, but you only need one form per employer. If you're working for two or three organizations right now and together it adds up to 30 hours per week on average, you need one form per employer. And each one of them will write in what your hours are for them um, and then you know, you put them together and they add up to your 30s. So you want to make sure that you have one form per employer. Um, okay, and if I founded a nonprofit uh, 501c3, how does this have an effect on the process? As long as you are getting a paycheck as an employee of that organization, uh, then it counts. Um, if you're the founder, but you are not being paid, so you are a volunteer, unfortunately that doesn't count. Whether you founded the organization or not, what counts is if you are being paid by the organization to work for that organization. Um, okay. And I am paying my school loan as required by my student loan provider. Is that a qualified repayment plan? It depends. There's lots of different repayment plans out there. There's the five that I showed you that are um, qualified repayment plans. There's five or six others that you could be on that are not qualified. So you just got to make sure that you verify what plan that you are actually on. Um, okay, so I'm going to move on from this. And when do you submit the employment certification form? Now, 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 today, tomorrow. <laughs> do it immediately. Um, Congress is trying to get rid of the program. They are <clears throat> most likely, like 99% unlikely, to be able to get rid of the program for anybody who has already taken out their loans. However, they can get rid of the program for any future borrowers. That's what they're trying to do. There is a, like I said, tiny, tiny chance that they could get rid of it for people who have already borrowed, who um, are maybe not, uh, haven't submitted an employment certification form yet. Um, so make sure you get those in now. Even if you expect it to be rejected for some reason, get it in now, see if you can get those corrections made. Um, one signed form per employer every year for your current employer, and then again when you leave. So even though uh, if you leave in the middle of the year and you submitted an employment certification form and three months later you leave, submit another one when you leave with your end date on it um, so that you make sure that they have that in there. And I mentioned the future of the Public Service Loan Forgiveness Program, the PROSPER Act, um, which is in Congress right now, the um, Committee on Education and the Workforce, they have a provision in there among a lot of other things that public service loan forgiveness is eliminated for future borrowers. It hasn't passed yet, um, but uh, they are trying to get it passed. It's in the House of Representatives. And uh, so um, I hope that all of you will join the coalition to preserve PSLF. And uh, that's the URL, preservepslf.com. It is a .com, um, but it is uh, linked to lobbyists who are working on behalf of all of us to um, preserve the PSLF and improve it. Um, they are the ones who got that technical fix about um, getting that extra money for folks who are on the wrong repayment plans in there. Um, so go to the website, sign up, make sure you send uh, emails or calls to your representatives, make sure that they know how important public service loan forgiveness is to you and to the work that you do in your community. So what do you do now? You revert, reser, review, excuse me, review the eligibility checklist, submit your employment certification forms every year. Have I said that enough? Do you know when to submit your employment certification forms? Um, take action at preservepslf.com and tell everyone about this program. Like I said, the biggest barrier to participation is that nobody knows it exists. Um, so make sure that you're telling all of your friends, all of your family, even if you don't know if they have student debt, even if they might have student debt in the future, sure um, tell everyone about this program share with them the resources make sure they know that um, there's a lot of details but uh, it is a fantastic program and everyone needs to 
see if they qualify, um, if not get forgiveness. Um, and if you are a manager or an HR person, um, download the student debt toolkit on our website, talk about how student debt is a problem for the nonprofit sector, um, include PSLF eligible employer in your job uh, posting saying, you know, hey, you know, we can help you. If you work for us, you, we can help you get this uh, forgiveness. Um, and then make sure that you complete and sign the employment certification forms every year for your employees and when they leave. Um, so just keep a note in your calendar about that to remind employees to do this every year. Um, if they qualify, you don't have to um, ask them about their debt. You don't have to ask them if they need the form. Um, just let them know that you're available, that you know what it is, and that you uh, are willing to sign it for folks uh, who are interested in doing it. Um, you don't need to know their personal details. Just make sure that they know that, it's a, that you're available. Um, let's see, we have a question. How do you find out if your employer is a 501c3? I work in a security organization. Um, ask them. Uh, they should know. <laughs> it has to do with how they incorporated and uh, ask your executive director or your CFO or um, pretty much anybody who handles any of their tax filings. Um, just ask. They'll know. And here is my information. So that is the end of all of the information that I'm going to um, kind of spew at you. Um, here's my information. If you have further questions, um, like I said, I'm, I'm not really a consultant on this, but if you have specific questions, you can let me know. I can share with you some more of the resources. Um, as I said, studentdebtcrisis.org is a great resource. They help people figure out their repayment plans and things like that as well. So um, definitely check out studentdebtcrisis.org. I meant to put that on here. Here and I didn't. Um, but this is my information. And as I said, you will be getting the recording and also my slides. Um, so uh, you'll be able to go through this information at your own pace. Um, we have, let's see, a question. Um, can I send in one certification form for past eligible employment and one for present employment? Yes. Um, so if you worked for an organization for three or four years, and this was, you know, four or five years ago, go ahead and get them to sign one of those forms. If for some reason they're out of business, um, there is a provision for that. So just read the employment certification form and, uh, and, and check the box where it says they went out of business or I can't find anybody or whatever it is. Um, there is a provision for that. Um, so thank you everyone for joining us. It looks like that's all the questions. Um, I will stick around for another minute or two uh, in case somebody's typing up a question that hasn't submitted yet. Um, but I am really grateful for all of you joining me today and for hearing about the program. Please, like I said, get your employment certification forms in and spread the word um, and check out PSLF, uh, preservepslf.com. Um, so thank you all for joining and have a great day. Not seeing any other questions come in, so I am going to end the webinar now. Thank you. Goodbye.